Celebrating 17 years of Young Turks. Hello and welcome to Young Turks, India's longest running show on entrepreneurships and startups. I'm Shireen Bhan. Now, since 2002, week over week, we put the spotlight on India's young entrepreneurs. Men and women who've been pushing the boundaries to build innovative and sustainable businesses. And we are excited to bring in 2019 with a brand new year with brand new startup stories. So on the show today, we welcome back our Young Turks mentors, Matrix Partners India, part of the Boston-based venture capital firm that manages assets across the US, China and India with a focus on startups in the consumer tech, B2B, enterprise and fintech space. Now, Matrix Partners India has recently raised its third round of $300 million bringing the total assets under management to approximately a billion dollars across its funds. To tell us more about this fundraise and the year ahead, joining us today are Avnish Bajaj, Tarun Davda and Vikram Bedianathan. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here on Young Turks and here's wishing all of you at Matrix a very happy 2019. Uh, Avnish, let me start by asking you about this fundraise, $300 million. Uh, looks like a great start to the year. Uh, what are you going to use the money for? First of all, thank you for having us, Shireen, and wish you and everybody at CNBC as well a very happy new year. Um, you know, by now, and I think you and I go back 15 years, I've, I'm now jaded, so <laughs> getting congratulated on raising money uh, is, is, as somebody told me, uh, getting congratulated on taking a mortgage on a house, right? you have to pay it back with interest and in this case with, with great returns. Uh, but yeah, it's a good start. Uh, we've we've uh, you know, had a good run, I believe, in India as, as a venture uh, ecosystem. As you know, it's not been an easy journey over mm. the last decade for the entire ecosystem. And I would say, of course, 2018 is going to be remembered for the, the big kahuna of all transactions, right? The Flipkart yes. Walmart transaction. But, uh, but I would say that that may miss the, the, the probably more important shift Mm. that happened in 2018. Mm. So we all know about, you know, the underlying factors about uh, about the growth, uh, which we can talk about. But I think the, the real story is not just the one exit, but the multiple number of exits mm. that happened uh, in 2000, 2018. A lot of them have been reported, whether Baiju, Swiggy, yeah. Ola, you know, a bunch of these. And I think that has that is what excites us more. So we take, uh, we, we, we thank our LPs uh, for, our, for the support. Uh, and are excited about about the fund in the context of a deepening market and a more mature uh, exits ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that uh, that you highlighted the shift that we're seeing that in, in the Indian startup system with multiple exits, specifically in 2018. Of course, Flipkart was the big one. Uh, but uh, Tarun, let me ask you then, in the context of, uh, of this fundraise and what you're seeing both in terms of valuations, whether they are in sync or aligned with fundamentals, and also with the, with the returns that and the returns expectation given what we've seen in the year gone by so I think Shireen uh, again thank you for having us I think uh, if you look at overall you know the Indian venture ecosystem I think it's really come of age uh, 2018 you know will go down as a pivotal year uh, in the ecosystem largely because of the fact that I think finally there is some proof of the pudding mm. yeah you know they've been like Avnish mentioned there's been a bunch of exits and it's been more broad-based than you know most people talk about but if I look at overall valuations in Indian tech today uh, in pockets, there is there is definitely some froth, uh, yeah. and the reality is Indian you know venture overall just works that way. Uh, valuations do tend to run a little bit ahead of of reality, but then eventually companies sort of execute and catch up, right? And so Indian e-commerce went through some phase in that, and there were some corrections in the middle, and then eventually you know sort of companies either you know reached that same valuation or in some cases have even exceeded that valuation. And we're seeing some of that in in pockets. You know, if food delivery, you know, people would say that some valuations are ahead of where they you know ideally should be. Yeah. But the reality is that I think you know these things do tend to catch up over time. And so our view is that, you know, India will continue. I think 2018 has had the highest number of sort of unicorns created. Yeah. Uh, we believe that this is only start of a much larger trend. Eight or nine unicorns uh, in 2018. That's uh, companies that crossed a billion dollars in valuations. So 2018 certainly uh, was a big year. But let me uh, talk about some of the issues, especially at the end of 2018, that did cloud sentiment in the startup space. And Vikram, let me put that question to you. Uh, you know, the ghost of the angel tax returns every few months, and it did again uh, uh, through the end of 2018. How much of a concern is that? What about your own portfolio companies? How many of them have been slapped with an income tax notice? 
So, yes, it was uh, uh, both, uh, uh, I would say, an irritant as well as uh, reality in terms of uh, bothering founders as well as angels across the board. Um, the, the good thing is that uh, overall as, a, as an ecosystem as well as, uh, as the media, um, there was enough pressure exerted and actually the, uh, the government and the regulatory authorities responded hmm. uh, and have acted pretty quickly to make sure uh, you know, uh, these things don't come up again and again. Uh, I think it's unfortunate, but uh, I, I think in the larger scheme of things where we are seeing this new ecosystem come out of nowhere, hmm. um, which is trying to get integrated into, into the economy as a whole, I think some of these things will come up uh, as long as we keep acting on these uh, very quickly as an uh, ecosystem. I think we should keep moving forward. But you know, Avnish, I just want to labor on this point a little bit because while we've now seen a, a fresh sort of clarification coming in from the CBDT saying that there should be no coercive action, the fact of the matter is that this is not a new problem. Uh, as I mentioned, this issue with angel tax resurfaces quarter after quarter. So the root cause, the fundamental issue has not been addressed. They've only merely uh, reacted to the pressure that was put by the startup ecosystem and said, okay, let's not take coercive action for now. The issue with respect to the income tax department's view of valuations, that continues to be a cause of concern and a point of friction. So this issue is not going away anytime soon, wouldn't you agree? Frankly, if you ask me, un unintended consequences. consequences when yeah. I speak to people on the policy side, you know, they, they always seem to be very well-intentioned, even with this e-commerce policy that came out. They all mm. seem to be well-intentioned and then there's something which is very draconian that comes out. And and not just the, the point you made about CBDT not uh, following up on, on, on some of these things. I also read that there was this, you have to kind of certify yourself yeah. to be a yeah. startup. Yes. Right? How do you, I mean, you, we're just creating more and more bureaucracy. So I think, do I have a silver bullet solution? No. The, the, the silver bullet solution is to move from guilty until proven innocent mm. to in innocent until proven guilty until that mindset shift happens and to me the tax buoyancy and a lot of that stuff is showing up hopefully will let let lead to that outcome that's the ultimate outcome right now along the way what all can we do you know i i don't i don't have a better answer than some kind of a certification of a startup mm. and therefore uh, you don't get but but the guide guidelines and the guardrails that were proposed yeah. uh, as part of startup india which is you know less yeah. than 3 years and this yeah. and none of that works yeah. so we have to come come up with some kind of self certification along with an auditor uh, certification and maybe hmm. showing some kind of a rbi filing or something okay. which is again more in the line of self certification okay. uh, which will then absolve you know give this set of companies uh, kind of immunity from this uh, prosecution. But the ultimate root cause as the tax terrorism has to stop. <laughs> well, uh, we've been waiting for that for a while now. I won't hold my breath. But Vikram, let me talk to you about uh, yeah. some of the other big shifts that we're seeing. And, uh, you know, 2018 continued with the momentum of uh, video and the explosion that we've seen with video, data consumption, 4G, now talking about 5G, uh, uh, local languages. Uh, what do you see as the big trends as we look ahead into 2019? And what would drive or pivot your investments? Oh, I, I think the, there are two or three big shifts that have happened over the last 12 to 18 months. One is uh, uh, obviously the users and how much they're using. And we were just looking at the recent data and it looks like uh, users are using up to 10 GB per, of data per month. Uh, and what that means is that for the first time we have a large enough base of users, call it you know, 350, 400, 500 million uh, users giving up a lot of their time mm. on their mobile. And that, uh, that time is just uh, multiplying as, uh, as we speak. Now that time is going to, some of it is going to go to the global platforms, but a lot of that is going to go towards the local platform. So mm. one of those themes that, that we are playing on is media and social. Yeah. And it's two pronged. One is that there will be lots of different slivers uh, on digital media, whether it is devotion, whether it's astrology, whether it is long form content, mm. all of which will become meaningful. Uh, it's also that there is now going to be a new way of reaching these users uh, and it's going to be applicable to commerce as a whole. And we think that's going to be a big wave of new commerce startups who are using social media in a different way, who are using long form media in a, in, in a different way to reach users and also 
uh, provide users a different way of uh, discovering uh, both products and services. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that's sort of one big trend. The second big trend that we are seeing, which is advantageous for Indian startups, is if you look at the, the uh, uh, before, we never did investments in um, in search or in, in social media mm. because they were thin stack businesses and some of the global players, like whether it is Facebook or Google, were yeah. really good at developing tech uh, and uh, reaching some of these users. But when you look at full stack businesses, mm. uh, Indian entrepreneurs are better a a at building moats, uh, localizing some of these businesses like we've seen with Ola, okay. where they're able to build full stack businesses which are transaction led businesses across the board. Okay, those are the two big uh, uh, trends that you see for 2019. Uh, Tarun, you know, you're a big believer also in, in the social commerce shift that we are seeing uh, play out. But I, I want to talk a little bit about this constant comparison that, uh, that we see uh, with India and China. And I, I would imagine that it's, it's somewhat of an unreasonable uh, comparison given the scale and size of, uh, uh, of what we're seeing in China versus what we're seeing in the Indian startup ecosystem. But that apart, I mean, the likes of Oyo, actually looking global, looking at the Chinese market, making inroads in a big way uh, into a market like China. How much of the Indian startup going global is likely to be a trend in 2019? So I think it's going to be a big trend and we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, the reality is, you know, startups like Oyo, like you mentioned, is, is, is you know, venturing out in China and other countries. Uh, one of our startups, Ola, has, you know, gone outside India and, you know, launched in Europe and Australia and New Zealand. I think the reality is a lot of these companies have reached scale in India. They have got a business model that is working. They have built enough depth in the org where they are able to, you know, now finally venture out and say, hey, you know what, I know the playbook. I've perfected the playbook mm. in India. India is a difficult market for me to execute. It's, it's, you know, all of us know the issues around lower transaction size and stuff like that. And now, actually, the, you know, companies are saying, hey, you know what, there is no reason why if I have the capital that is available, mm. I have the org leadership that you know that is required to you know scale this uh, business model. You know why shouldn't these companies be venturing out, right? And so we're seeing again you know uh, good success with Ola's international plans. Uh, Oyo has started up. You know you know Baiju's has been talking about doing uh, acquisitions yeah. outside India. So I think it's just a start of a much larger trend that will continue to play out. Avnish, would you agree with that? And and what would excite you the most about this uh, uh, global story that we're likely to see play out? Well, Tarun is sitting next to me, so I can't really disagree with him, <laughs> but I will tell you that that excites me lesser. <laughs> yeah. So that excites me lesser than winning India. I think, I think uh, we have, I, the way I see it is that within India, we'll have, we have always competed with the, with the global companies, right? The new breed of global companies is the Chinese companies. So they are also coming after India. So is the next breed of global companies Indian companies? Absolutely. Uh, but not at the cost of losing their home market. Hmm. So I think the only caution I would draw in this is make sure you have your home market sealed up. Hmm. Don't get complacent about it. Uh, and, and recognize that the, the Chinese companies are now, uh, you know, the, the first wave of the internet kind of went to the Americans in India. Yeah. The second wave, the Indian companies kind of uh, created value. The third wave, where Indian companies are trying to explode in value, we have the Chinese companies coming hmm. in. So everybody recognizes that this is the, the next kind of, uh, uh, you know, place where uh, significant value creation will happen. Mm. So I think we have to be a little bit more careful uh, on that front. Let me just circle back for a second, Shirin, to the point you asked earlier about content and commerce, if I may. Um, there is this overarching thing, if one goes back to the, to the origin of the internet, mm. the internet was created to disintermediate, yeah. right? Guess what happened? The internet created very large intermediaries, mm. a trillion dollar companies, mm. Microsoft, uh, you know, uh, Amazon, yeah. Google, Apple, Facebook, everybody kind of became close to a trillion dollars on the back of the internet. I think what we are seeing as a shift globally, now interestingly on this one, India may be at par with the global trend, mm. is the fact of this mobile instrument in your hand becoming almost a computer and increasingly uh, you know a very powerful computer with a lot of data mm. so you have that going on at the same time as a result of which video is going off, uh, taking off then you have trends like ar vr yeah. so i almost think of a situation where we are going to move from this intermediaries in the middle 
you know, connecting people to people connecting themselves. Mm. And social commerce is, is just a starting point, point of that, mm. right? So, so almost think of, uh, you know, moving back from the days of uh, modern retail in a shopping mall to a, to a market where I should be able to negotiate directly with somebody, yeah. use audio, use video, use, mm. you know, use all of that. So I think we are in the middle of a very powerful new trend, mm. uh, which for a change we may not be behind in India. We may actually be at par, just given uh, the uh, the state of the mobile uh, ecosystem and and data usage. Well, that's a good note to take a break on. When we return, we continue our conversation with Matrix Partners India. Three hundred million dollars—that's the new fund—and uh, we'll talk to them about what excites them for 2019 and the big misses as well. Celebrating 17 years of Young Turks. Welcome back. You're watching Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. We're in conversation with Matrix Partners India. I want to pick on the point that you made there that you would be a little more cautious on this global story uh, and you would like Indian entrepreneurs to win in India and ensure that they've got the home market covered. Uh, to both of you, and, and Tarun, let me start by asking you, uh, what is it that you've seen uh, the Indian entrepreneurs do differently in 2018. I mean, in the last two or three years, there has been a fair degree of a shakeout. Uh, I think we've come of age. There has been a degree of maturity that we've seen uh, and uh, a much more sort of laser focus on, uh, on the path to profitability as well. What have you seen change with the way founders are, are approaching the winning formula? Actually, that's a great question, Shreen. It's something that you know we talk about a lot internally. Uh, you know, so one of the big things or one of the big shifts that we've seen in the last, I would say, three or four years is, you know, in, in the 2013, 14, 15 era, a lot of the companies that are well known today, you know, whether it's Oyo, whether it's Swiggy, whether it's Ola, whether it's, you know, Flipkart and a bunch of these companies were started by, you know, young mm. graduates with maybe a year or two of experience and who were doing this for the first time, right? And so there was a, you know, a, a completely, uh, a, a playbook that had to be discovered completely off, you know, from, from ground zero. What we are seeing now is actually given that, you know, and this is the way venture has, you know, worked in US and China for, for years, uh, uh, where people who have been part of, you know, uh, building high quality companies and high quality startups, uh, eventually venture out and, mm. and, you know, launch their own startup, right? And so this has been happening in Silicon Valley since decades. Yeah. It's been happening in China with BAT, where a bunch of, you know, entrepreneurs who have built large companies today have had at some point in time worked at one of these large companies, right? Uh, India didn't used to have that kind of startup mm. ecosystem mm. until, until you know, very recently, right? And so I think that the, the very interesting trend that we're seeing and it's reflecting in some of the investments yeah. we've made recently is a lot of people who have been have now worked closely with some of these star founders have understood what it takes to build and scale startups very rapidly mm. you know what it takes to build an organization what it you know means to actually figure out a business model with these startups a lot of them are now having experience that you know are from a distance and working with these founders right. are now venturing out on doing it by themselves uh, and I think that trend to me is 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 very very exciting, and mm. you know we should continue to see uh, significantly you know higher quality of founding teams of the gates. What that is also doing to your other point is there is a big focus now on creating sustainable businesses. Mm. Uh, so you know I I am a, a very uh, unashamedly I have said <laughs> that you know when I started Bazi, uh, sale was. Sale was very much on the uh, was 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 uh, the selling the company was very much something that if you asked me I would have said yeah huh. you know that is very much on the on the agenda. Today it's very different. So part of it what Tarun said you are you are picking up mid -career, mid career executives mm. who have been trained in outstanding uh, unicorn type of environments. They have seen this fast pace. They are playing for the real long term. Mm. They are playing the long game, right? And I think that's a big shift. I have started hearing bunch of our companies on record, you know, whether it's Quicker, Ola, Lime, mm. a bunch have been talking about profitability, yeah. right? Uh, that's, I mean, as a venture capitalist, obviously it's music to the ears, but even a Kirana store is profitable. Uh. So it's not about profitability. Uh. It's about value creation. It's about profitability at scale, mm. right? And, and these companies are executing towards that, which ultimately will lead to IPOs. Mm. So, you know, we have, we have crossed the first step of the venture ecosystem, mm. which is exits. But why are the exits coming? The exits are coming because the later stage investors are seeing that you will eventually, these companies are heading towards IPO scale, hmm. right? I think that is but a how, how, I mean, massive we've been waiting, shift. 
We've been waiting, Being Avnish, for a while. By the founders. We've been waiting for a while. Uh, when when do we see the when do we see this IPO pipeline, so to speak, <laughs> taking off finally? Well, you you and I have been waiting uh, about <laughs> the same amount of time. But let me tell you, uh, let me tell you how we think about it. And you know, this is truly something I I believe in. I, you know, and I've told my investors this that two three years ago, if you asked me, I could not put and they did ask me. I could not put my hand on my heart and say within the next three to four years mm. you will see IPOs of Indian companies. Okay. Today I'm ready to say that. I was actually ready to say that a year ago. Huh. Uh, and I'll tell you why. The IPO scale comes from, if you look at NASDAQ IPO as a, as a benchmark and then we can mm. you know back into India because mm. NASDAQ has the most sophisticated investors for mm. this asset class, right? If you look at NASDAQ IPO as a benchmark, you need give or take 80 to 100 million dollars of high margin, high growth revenue. Right. And to and with that, you end up with with give or take a billion dollar company, mm. and hence you have an IPO, mm. right? Uh, that until three years ago was nowhere on the horizon. Mm. Today, I can point to 15 to 20 companies, some of which are in our portfolio, others we have uh, missed and are in other people's uh, portfolio, mm. where I know that those numbers are happening. Mm. And those, well, not happening, meaning there's a trend line to that. Right. Whether it is in calendar year 19 in some cases, in calendar year 20 in some cases, in calendar year 21 in some okay. cases. So it is not, no longer, no longer a hope. Uh, this time, it, there's actually on the horizon, one can see it in the execution mm. of the companies and therefore there is the confidence that get three years from today, we would look back and say five to seven companies are public. Uh, I can, I can and, and the reason I feel confident of five to seven is, there, is that because I can see 15 to 20 kind of hitting those kind of benchmarks. Of your, uh, of your would, portfolio which companies, uh, which would you be most confident about uh, IPOing in the next three to four years? And do you believe an international listing is more likely than an Indian listing? No, no, no. So, so uh, I'll, I'll answer both. International listing I was using as a benchmark because mm. that is the most sophisticated investor pool. Mm. If you ask me, and by the way, some of our founders have that pride in wanting to take their companies. Like, you know, Reliance created the equity culture in the huh. 80s. This is a new asset class getting created. Why should it get created in India, huh. right? Now, the, the issue is I'm not sure the sophistication of the investors is there yet mm. in India mm. for this asset class. So using NASDAQ more as a benchmark. But I think some of it will be structural, but I think it will be 50-50 between companies that will go public here and public there because some of these are household brand names mm. and they'll get probably a, more of a premium here uh, than in the US. In our portfolio, and I, I think the founders will shoot me for it, but whatever. Uh, Ola, <laughs> Quicker, Daily Hunt, M-Swipe, uh, Five Star. Uh, I think these are the five that come to mind, uh, top of the mind. Uh, who could, which which should be going public in that horizon, or will be IPO ready? Some of them may pull the trigger, some of them may not pull okay. the trigger. You know, you know, multiple factors go into it. Yeah. But yes, in that horizon. Okay, that 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 doesn't look bad at all. As you said, uh, uh, whether they pull the trigger or not is a different question. But you believe that they will certainly be IPO ready, half a dozen or so at least from your portfolio. Uh, but uh, uh, Tarun and Vikram, let me come to you now for closing comments. And uh, Tarun, I'll start by asking you the startups that uh, you're most excited about. Uh, uh, as we look ahead and the big misses uh, uh, that the startups that you would have liked to invest in but you couldn't so startups that we are most excited by I think uh, you know we've spoken about it let me you know versus taking specific companies let me tell you broad themes that we're excited by and I think you know that would uh, cover a bunch of companies because some of them are still very young right so so you know we spoke about social commerce mm. I think it's a it's a big big trend that we believe in the reality is that the first hundred million people in India uh, you know, shopped using a search experience and they, they use the, you know, standard sort of e-commerce models that have worked uh, globally. Uh, I don't think the next three to 500 million internet users will be shopping uh, online in that model. Mm. And so there is going to be a bunch of influencer-led commerce, you may call it, social commerce, you may call it, you know, some form of these, you know, models mm. uh, are likely to achieve significant scale. And so that's, you know, one big theme that we are betting behind. Uh, fintech continues to be a theme that, uh, mm. you know, uh, it has been hot 
I would say for the last two years became you know cooled off a little bit in the last six months. And but long term, you know, is there value creation mm. coming there? We think there's a lot of value creation. Our transportation is a space. You know, mm. all of us uh, you know feel the acute pain of you know commuting in in Indian cities. And so you know, Ola obviously has done a fantastic job in solving that problem. We think there are multiple other micro mobility plays mm. uh, that will continue to sort of you know help uh, uh, make commute easier for the Indian consumer. Uh, I, I would say broadly these are the themes, right, in, in terms of what we will continue to bet on. You know, there's going to be local language content plays and a bunch yep. of other stuff that we've spoken about already. Yep. Uh, in terms of misses, uh, I think all the unicorns, the ones that we aren't in, we would have loved <laughs> to be in. And so, you know, when you look at uh, Swiggy, I think they've done a fantastic job of execution on, on food tech. If you look at, you know, Freshworks, they've done a, you know, excellent job in actually proving out that a scalable, you know, global SaaS company can be built out of India. So I think there's examples across the board. The reality is, you know, uh, we would have loved to be in all the unicorns. The reality is that's not how it works, but that's what we aspire for. Tarun, I just want to pick up on that point that you made about uh, micromobility plays. Uh, uh, Vogo is one of your portfolio companies shared along with electric. Is that going to be a big trend that you uh, that excites you that you see uh, as as a big play in 2019? I, I think so. I think if you you know look at uh, sort of the various use cases and you cut you know various segments of your know, users as well as the use cases, the reality is what you will see is that there are a bunch of you know short commute, low value transactions today that are probably not being served in the most ideal fashion, mm. right? And so the, our our investment in Vogo is actually trying to solve that particular use case where somebody is seeking independence, somebody is seeking flexibility, somebody is seeking uh, a point to point short distance commute at a you know reasonable cost right and today there aren't too many options that actually serve that use case mm. and so i think what we will you know increasingly do is while you know ola and uber have have done a you know great job in solving sort of the generic use cases mm. i think there are pockets of use cases that are not being served as well and so there will be a bunch of plays you know some of them some of them will be electric some of them will be, will be through traditional sort of means but we will continue to see a lot more of these use cases being sold well, Vikram, Tarun and Avnish, uh, thanks very much for joining us here on Young Turks. We wish uh, you and uh, your team the very best of luck. I believe you moved into a new office as well. So uh, wish you all the best for a great new innings there. Thanks, uh, as always, for joining us here on Young Turks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Shireen. Thank you for having us. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this Young Turks special from all of us here on the show. Goodbye. Many thanks for watching.